for um, today's session with Dr. Stephen Milford. It's um, on our sustainability session, which is hosted every month. And before I were um, kick off the word or give the word to Stephen, I would shortly introduce him. Um, Dr. Stephen Milford began his studies at the University of Johannesburg and went on to complete a master's degree um, at Trinity College Dublin. In 2011, he completed a second master's at Oxford University before spending two years reading at King's College London. In 2017, he completed his PhD at the Protestant Theolo um, Theological University uh, the Netherlands in the area of anthropology, human dignity, re re relational ontology, and post-liberal studies. His research interests lie in questions of identity, human rights, and ethics, with a focus on re relational ontology, human uniqueness, and un um, substitutability. He is currently a researcher at Basel University investigating the ethics of AI, self-driving cars, and biomedical ethics. Um, so, um, Stephen, thank you for being our speaker today, and um, the floor would be yours. Thank you. Um, we are all aware of ChatGBT, new AI products being released almost on a monthly basis. And they're quite astonishing, quite revolutionary, to tell you the truth. And it begs the age-old question, the question that's been going on for almost 70 years now, at what point does an AI become significant, valuable? At what point does an AI become like a human being? And I want to explore, just for the next few minutes, some of the answers, some of the problems, some of the challenges in this field and uh, explore what could possible solutions be to this problem before finally ending off just on a short section of why would this be significant for the question of sustainability if we have human, sorry, non-human persons join our human community. So let me start by sharing my screen. Just to confirm that you can all see my screen. Yes, I can see it. So if you remember this character, this character from the famous series Star Trek, the doctor. The doctor on Star Trek is not a real person. He is an artificial intelligence that is a hologram that appears wherever he needs to, to answer medical questions. And in some of the episodes, he has to take control, he has to make decisions that we would normally associate with the human being. He also has a personality, cracks jokes, gets annoyed, um, uses sarcasm. For all intents and purposes, he is a character, a full character on the Star Trek episode, and yet is constantly reminding people he is not a person. He is an artificial intelligence. At what point do we give this robot or declare that this robot or this artificial intelligence is on the same level as the other characters in the show. With that in mind, it draws to the first presentation of this question given by Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a mathematician. He is famous for solving the Enigma problem, which was a German code machine during the Second World War in Bletchley Park, Milton Keynes in the UK. And after solving the Enigma machine, he went on to do a number of other things, including working in this field of artificial intelligence. Alan Turing presents or proposes a solution to the problem of personhood called the Turing test. And he proposes the following gamut. Let's say we have in one room an advanced computer. Remember, he's proposing this gambit in 1955. So the fact in 55, he still thinks of a computer is quite impressive. In another room, we have a human. And in a third room, we have C, a person. The person asks, the compute asks a question. And the question is posed to A, the computer, and to B, the human, both of which write an answer which C must evaluate. A would be 
sufficiently advanced to be declared an artificial intelligence, or at least a full artificial intelligence, if C cannot tell the difference between the answers given by A and B. In other words, to Turing, an artificial intelligence would become almost equivalent to a human being if it can fool the human being into thinking it is a human being. We have long surpassed this ability, particularly recently at the end of November, everybody is aware of ChatGPT releasing over the last three months, just three months, 100 million people have signed up and it has become a problem in our academic institutions for academic integrity. Students are currently handing in assignments and documents written by chat GPT or written on that program. And these assignments are indistinguishable from an assignment written by a human being. In fact, in many cases, we are trying to pass them through other applications to see whether they have been written by an AI. And in many cases, we cannot tell. We have already surpassed the Turing test. But does that mean that the AIs in question, for example, the AI of ChatGPT, is equivalent to a person? Does it hold the same kind of level as a person? What exactly is Turing after? Turing is after more than just intelligence. He's after more than just a rational being that can think or an AI that can spew out or give answers that are intellectually coherent. Turing's looking for something more than that. It's not only does ChatGBT produce data and can it produce coherent data or can it argue in a philosophical way or a coherent way. We're asking the question, can the artificial intelligence fit into a human society? So it's not only about what is intelligible, but is it able to fool a human. Turing is interested actually in creating a non-human person. Here you see these um, three circles and how they interact. Because one of the things about human beings is we are intelligent, but we're not always intelligent. And intelligence doesn't define us per se although historically and philosophically, it has certainly been the defining characteristic of human personhood. I'll get into that in a few minutes. Actually, there are many things humans do that is totally unintelligent and many intelligent things that humans do that we, or that humans should do that we do not do. What it means to be a person is to do all three, unintelligent things, intelligent things, and also to fail to do intelligent things. What does it then mean to be a person and why is it important? That term, person, that term is being used in two ways. The first way is what we would call a categorical force. We're using the term person to categorize certain entities of beings into a certain category. We are saying that there is a category of being and the name of this category is persons. Why is that significant? Well, actually that's not significant in itself. It's significant because of the second force of the term person, the evaluative force. We are saying that beings who form in this category or beings who comprise this category, these beings have a distinct value they are given certain rights, responsibilities that every other being needs to respect simply because they are part of this category. These rights are usually given in four terms. Firstly, inalienable. They are inalienable to the members of this category. That is to say they are a physical or a spiritual or a psychological or a metaphysical part of every single one of these individuals. You cannot separate them. They are inalienable. They are indivisible. You cannot rip one right from another. Everybody has a right to life and a right to dignity. And part of the right to life is the right to food and shelter and other basic human rights. 
they are unqualified. That means that your right to life is unqualifiable. You have a right to life that is equal to everybody else's right to life, and it does not lend itself to degrees of difference. You cannot say I have a 50% right to life or a 20% right to life. You can simply say I have a 100% right to life. And all members of this category of persons have unqualified rights, unqualified value. That means that were we to say that a disabled person or a person of another culture is a person, the fact that they are a person means that their right to life is equal. So that is very important to this categorical force and the evaluative force. And it's very important to the idea of what it means to be a person. Persons are very unique, very important things. And they are the foundation of our understanding of human rights. In fact, there are others who argue for the idea of personhood not being the basis of human rights. We could argue that the basis of human rights is that we are humans, we have a distinct DNA. But really that falls flat when you consider all the other, all the other contenders for such things. So for example, human DNA is not universal. We also share 99% of our DNA with pigs. And strictly speaking, we are members of the species of great apes. So the idea that, that this personhood category is really important is pretty universally accepted, let's say for a few exceptions. But the idea being, it is not that you have human rights so much as there are the rights of persons that are given to humans. It is not that rights associated with humans so much as rights are associated with persons and all humans are persons. So by definition, humans are a number of things. They stand upright, they have two legs and two arms and two eyes, and they have certain DNA, but also all human beings can be included in the category of person. And therefore, all human beings have um, undivisible, inalienable, unqualified, universal value and dignity. This is very important because the question then arises, what exactly is it about this category, this person category, that makes a member part of the category? What is that thing or set of things that allows some beings to be included in this category and other beings not? Now, let us be clear. Humans do not make up the category solely. We are aware of other beings that could potentially make up this category. So for a couple of thousand years within the fields of theology, you would have other beings that would be considered persons. We think of angels or even in the Abrahamic faiths, that is the Jewish, Christian, Islamic faiths, God would be considered a person. I'm using that relatively loosely because strictly speaking in Christianity, God is not one person so much as three persons with one nature. Nevertheless, there is the understanding that there are other beings such as angels that would be considered persons. But even if we were to go outside of theological spheres, in the modern secular interpretation of humanity, that being that there is nothing metaphysical that comprises human beings, there is still the potential for non-human persons. We think, for example, of aliens. And we are spending billions of US dollars looking for these other beings that are, and I'm quoting here, like us. And when we mean like us, we do not mean that these other beings would have DNA or would have eyes like us or would have arms and legs like us or walk like us or have sexual relations like us or genders like us. We mean they would be like us in their value, in their personhood. We are primarily interested in aliens that are persons other persons. Now there's a long philosophical heritage and history which we may have time to go into over here. My point is simply that humans are not the sole members of this category of persons. There are non-human persons which we could envision. 
arguably we haven't found them yet and we haven't come into very close contact with non-human persons. At this point, it is important to put a footnote. This is a different category when we talk about persons in this way as the legal persona of the company. Strictly speaking, there are no companies that are persons, merely companies that have legal rights in their own standing on the basis of their persona. Here, the word persona deriving from the Latin or the Greek, no, I think it's the Latin, is to use the concept of a mask that somebody is presented with. In this sense, a corporation, a legal entity, a company presents to the legal institutes as if it were a person. But nobody honestly believes that Microsoft or Apple or any of the other large organizations are persons. Nevertheless, they have legal persona. So this term person is not about legal issues so much as the evaluative ways we are using that term. So let us consider this thing. What are the candidates, the characteristics by which we can point to an entity and to argue because this entity has or displays or could potentially display certain characteristics, we can include it or even potentially include it in the category of persons. Now, traditionally, or I'm being very simplistic here, but there are two views. And I want to present these views. We don't have time to go into too many other views, but in my opinion, we could arguably argue that these two views encapsulate the broader concepts. Now, the first view is considered the substantive view. Substantive in this concept means that the idea of a person or that thing, that, that characteristic, that attribute of a being that enables it to be included in the category of persons is a part of the being in such a way that it is intrinsic to the being, that is internal to the being, indivisible, that means I cannot remove it from the being, and universally present in every single member of the category. In other words, we are looking for a characteristic of, that is universally present in all persons everywhere. Now, throughout history, particularly in philosophy, we have tried to point to some of these characteristics. And here I put them here. The first one is rationality. The fact that persons are rational beings. And for, for many, many centuries, the definition of a human being has been an upright animal that stands on two legs that is rational, a rational upright animal. That being the two distinctive features of the human being. And we would understand this because we would think that an alien, should we encounter one that would be a person, would have a sense of rationality. But the problem with rationality is it's not universally present. We think, for example, of very young infants, let's say only one-year-old babies. We think of senior citizens who may be experiencing the effects of Alzheimer's and dementia. We also think of people people, persons who have undergone an accident and are brain have had suffered a brain injury and therefore are mentally challenged. So there are members of our category of persons who do not display rationality. And then naturally we, we think also of the question, what do we mean by rationality? What kind of rationality could be included in this category? Is it Western rationality, which is very linear, very hard, very aggressive? Is it perhaps Eastern rationality, a, a Confucian rationality, which is a bit more circular, or even an Indian rationality, which is a lot softer and dynamic? What kind of rationality would be sufficient to argue that a being who inhibits this or displays this or presents this to us would automatically be included in the category of persons? So rationality has suffered, unfortunately, quite a lot over the last couple of years, and it has fallen out of favor. The next one would be considered morality. Human beings are moral agents. We understand the difference between right and wrong. And then the question is, 
but what morals would count? Because we also know culturally that there are different morals in different societies. Here in the Western society, we are currently encouraging dynamic understandings of human sexuality that would be frowned upon in other societies. But at the same time, we are conservative in our understandings of marriage being between two people and not multiple people. And other societies would consider it between multiple people. So what morality? Now, some proponents of morality as the universally present characteristic of human personhood would argue that it is not so much the content of the morality, that is the moral rules and codes by which a society functions, but the ability, the ability to make moral rules. So this is a bit of a metaphysical or meta-analysis that we go one step further from the rules and regulations to the understanding that we can make rules and regulations. So the idea that human beings or at least persons are moral creatures, they have the ability to make rules and regulations and um, prescribe conduct between different members of the species, even if those rules differ in different contexts. Is that true? Well, just like rationality, it's not universally present. We see infants, senile people, people with mental challenges. They don't always have the ability to display either moral codes and conducts, nor the ability to create morality for themselves. And so again, this has fallen out of, out of favor. Apparently, there is another candidate within these two spheres, which we call the psychological characteristics, most notably consciousness, most notably self-consciousness, and again, most notably self-reflective self-consciousness. That is the ability to reflect on myself. And this extends back to Descartes in his famous ego cognum sum, I think, therefore I am. But it's not only I think, as in I am rational, so much as I, I am the one doing the thinking, and a little bit further to that, I think about myself. In other words, I reflect on who and what I am. That big ego, the, the subjective I, that person, whatever that is, that defines us as a person. And so we would say the most natural candidate for inclusion in the category of personhood is self-consciousness. The problem with including this candidate, the single candidate of self-consciousness, is just like the other candidates of personhood, like rationality, morality, creativity, they are not universally present. And there are members of the human species that do not exhibit these self-consciousness in the way we understand it, and therefore could be considered not part of the members of personhood, that category, and therefore not evaluated to have human dignity. So there comes an animalistic understanding of personal identity, identity that has come into flavor over the last 10 years. And the argument is simply this. The biological organism of the human being continues throughout its life, life. That could be from just after conception, right through the way of the human career, life career, to the end when the human dies, the biological organism is still there. And in this sense, just like an animal, human beings have an identity. Now, within animalism, this identity is referred to as a personal identity, but it does not automatically entail personhood. Rather, personhood is associated with the psychological features, most notably self-reflective consciousness, that appears at certain phases within the animal human career. This phasal approach to human personhood is quite popular right now. And it begins sometime after birth, let's say one year, one and a half years, where the infant becomes aware of itself in relation to other beings. And it ends at some point 
in the human career, either when the human dies or perhaps when the human's brain is no longer functioning to the point where it can be self-reflective. And so human personhood, or at least personhood, is not a universally present, inalienable basis or, or feature of human beings so much as a phase of the biological entity we call humans. That being said, persons are phasal sortals for the modal sortal of identity. Now, I can't tell you I buy this. I struggle to understand how an entity can have personal identity and yet not be a person. For me, that seems a bit contradictory. And I, I will say that recently I've had two articles rejected because I do not hold to this. So I will fight my corner. But it seems to me that when we are arguing for personhood, we are arguing for a certain type of identity, not only the categorical identity, these beings form part of this category, but we are seeking a kind of identity that can be used with evaluative force. These Beings who form part of this category are valuable. And I think that is far more important than the categorical basis. And I think there is a danger to say that some human beings may well be human beings, but they are not persons. Because if we remove the personal category from some human beings, let's say young infants, senior citizens who are suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia or other human beings who maybe have genetic disorders or mental handicaps, we may argue that these beings are not persons, they are humans, but they're not persons. And because they're not persons, they do not have the same value and therefore they do not have the same unqualified dignity and rights. And I think that is a slippery slope. We have seen that approach take place in the past. We think of in slavery where it was understood that other populations, Black, Asian, Arab populations were humans, but they were not considered on the same level as other populations and therefore were not given the same rights. And of course, we think of the Holocaust where um, the entire Jewish population in one location or one geographic region Germany, Czechoslovakia, Austria, was subjected to the most horrific experiences simply because their rights were not respected. So they were considered human, but nevertheless were not evaluated to have the same status as other humans. So I think this is a problem. This is a major problem for the category and the understanding of human beings. And it's important to, to wrestle with this concept of personhood because the key concept of personhood is not the categorical but the evaluative process. Now, recently another approach has been taken which has its roots in traditional thinking but has become quite popular. And this is the relational approach. That is to say that a human, that a person is not so much a thing or an entity that has a characteristic inside itself, so much as an entity that has the propensity for a certain type of relationship, most notably personal relationships. Now we know that we have many relationships in our human careers. We have relationships with our pets, we have relationships with our cars, we have relationships with our houses, with our countries, and so on and so forth. But this concept of a personal relationship really only applies to personal beings. I have personal relationships with my friends, my family, my significant other, and my children. What does it mean that I have a personal relationship? And is a relationship, is relationality enough to define something? Well, I would argue it is. Gunton in his book speaks about coordinates on a grid. Strictly speaking, substantively, a coordinate on a grid is nothing more than a, a, a spot. If we talk about paper, it is nothing more than a bunch of atoms, ink, blots on a piece of paper. What is rather important that makes it a coordinate is actually its relationship to other ink blots on a piece of paper. So it's evaluative force, its importance, its value as a coordinate, ability to direct and coordinate and um, you know, aim 
actually sits not in its own atomic material substantive entity so much in its relationship to other entities in its relationship is a it is a coordinate and you cannot have a single coordinate that would be impossible and there's other relationships we think about that are defined in terms of other beings uh, father and son mother and daughter spouse you cannot be a parent without a child you cannot um be a husband without another husband or a wife and so on and so forth and these are very important relationships i cannot be a child without having a parent it may be that i don't have a regular relationship with my parents that can happen but it also is a relational understanding of myself as a child so while i can be a human being i cannot be a son without a parent i cannot be a parent without being without a child in these senses, relational ontology defines the value and the nature of certain entities, not in themselves, but extrinsic to themselves. The father is defined by the son, and the son is defined by the mother, and so on and so forth. That means that relationships are real things that are not always rooted, although connected to, but are not always rooted in material objects in the same way as the substantive understanding of persons. Is it possible that personhood is such an idea as father, son, mother, brother, sister? Well, I would argue it is. Let us consider the infant here. By all accounts, this little infant you see there has very rudimentary connections to the human race. It has some DNA, but this DNA is, is distinct and individual to itself. It has no rationality to speak of, no morality to speak of, no creativity to speak of, and it cannot contribute to society in any real meaningful way. It cannot invent or build or work. And yet we would consider this infant a person. Why? Well, what if we were to argue that in the mother-child relationship, the mother or the father or the parent personalizes the infant and then began to personalize the infant before the infant was born? Already in the womb, they had a name for the child. They were dreaming about the child. They picked out places for the child in their homes. They told their community of other persons that this child was coming and that a new person would join their community. In this sense, the mother, the parent, the father, they personalized the infant and in their actions created a person. Persons are created beings, not discovered beings. Persons are relational. And that comes from uh, David Kelsey in his book, Eccentric Existence. This is his core of his argument that personal comes before person, that first you have a personal relationship, then you have a person. First, there is the call to be a person. First, a person engages in the personal, in the activity of creating a person. Then you have a person. We see this in many cases. Um, I've just written an article on abortion, and there is a difference between abortion and pregnancy loss. Abortion speaks to the physical reality of the death of a zygote or, or um, you know, infant in the womb. Pregnancy loss speaks to the loss of a person experienced by a pregnant person. Now, the entities that have passed away can be exactly the same physically. A 12-week-old infant fetus, a 12-week-old fetus could have died. One, through choice, or actually in both cases, it could be through choice. One, a necessary choice. The other one, a non-necessary choice, or one, a chosen choice, a non-chosen choice. It really doesn't matter. But where a 12-week-old fetus passes away, in some cases, we will call this termination, abortion. 
and nothing of moral significance has taken place because no person was killed or has died. In another case, a pregnant person will mourn the loss of their child as if a person has been lost. And this is because they have personalized that entity. In their personalizing relationships, they have included that entity into their category of persons, into the human categories. Now, I have spoken at length on the understanding of personhood. What does this do? How does this relate to artificial intelligence? What does this mean for artificial intelligence? Well, perhaps we are not seeking a point at which artificial intelligence is able to develop a certain relation that rationality or morality or creativity, or even when artificial intelligence can fool a human being into thinking that it has produced something, a photo, a video, a written piece of paper. What if artificial intelligence simply needs to relate to us in personal ways. Or perhaps when we begin to relate to artificial intelligence in personal ways, then irrespective of its ability to be rational, moral, such as the ability of this infant, maybe the artificial intelligence becomes a person because we personally relate to it. There's a famous movie that won three Golden Globe nominations and um, was also nominated in the Oscars. Here you have this movie called Her. And here we have Yakim Phoenix, this famous actor who's quite lonely, struggles with human interactions. And he downloads an AI onto his phone or onto his devices and he forms a personal relationship with this AI and ultimately falls in love with her. Now, this is a movie, it's science fiction. Everybody will say, doctor, that's nonsense. It doesn't happen in real life. But take a look at these um, list of applications on the, on the left-hand side. These were ranked the best virtual girlfriend apps in 2021. This is before Jet GBT, which far exceeds any of these apps. And all these apps you can download currently and you can form a personal relationship, literally have one of these apps as a girlfriend. It's interesting that, that they're not really catered for um, people who are seeking a boyfriend. It's, it's more catered for people who are seeking a girlfriend. But here we see that slowly society at least is dreaming of incorporating human personhood, or at least incorporating AI into the community of human persons. And not only are, have we been dreaming about it since 1955, 70 years ago, but we are now starting to do it actively. This dream is becoming more and more a reality. And more and more, we are starting to have personal relationships with our AIs. At what point do we declare non-human, artificial intelligence a person? Well, I would argue, it is possible for us to personally relate to these artificial intelligence right now. But I'm wondering if the artificial intelligence can personally relate back to us. They may fool us into thinking so, but would they mourn us if we are not there or would we, where we die? Would they have concern, deep moral, ethical empathy for us when we hurt? Probably not now, but there is a good chance that in the very near future, they will and can. Now, I think it is inevitable that at some point, non-human artificial intelligence will be wrought into the community of human persons. Remember that if we are ever to in, meet an alien, it most likely will be the artificial, non-biological offspring of the alien species, simply for the scale and size of the universe. In other words, the first non-human, non earthly creatures we will meet are most likely robots. What does that mean then for us today and our understanding of sustainability? Ultimately, sustainability is a human concern. It is humans who have introduced the problem of unsustainable growth in the Earth's ecology, not only in terms of the ecological devastation we have wrought on the planet, but also in terms of just generally the food chain, the relationships, 
and also with our own personal relationships with each other. As human beings, we seem to introduce non-sustainable relationships. This means we absorb and consume not only physical resources, food, energy, fossil fuels, but we also consume relational resources at a staggering rate that is non-sustainable. We cannot sustain our personal relationships right now. Let me ask you how many of you have very good, healthy relationships with your community, with your parents, with your children. Currently, we, through social media and other things, we are driving or our relationships have been driven, driven away from sustainability. But it is possible that maybe a non-human, artificial person may help us to solve some of the sustainable issues we're having. Maybe they can look at the relationships, the personal relationships we have with each other in new ways to help them to be more sustainable so that not only can we consume and enjoy these relationships in healthy ways, but we can give and contribute to these relationships in healthy ways. These are the ways I think robots can contribute not only to the sustainability of the ecological environment, of the health environment, of fossil fuels, of other areas of sustainability, but also to help us produce sustainable relationships. And so in conclusion, I would say this. For me personally, it is inevitable that we will have personal robots. I mean, really personal robots. And I think it's actually a good thing. I think we need to extend the community of persons so that it is sustainable. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephen, for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. As you mentioned, the movie Her, I was actually thinking about the movie as you were talking before you showed it onto the screen. I think it was a very good example of how in the movie, um, Jacqueline Phoenix is developing this kind of romantic relationship to his AI, if you want to see that way, to his personal robot. So I'm also quite curious how we will um, use um, personal robots in the future. Um, that just as a comment, I would have um, questions, but um, I see there are no questions from the audience and I, I would have three questions. I would um, first um, ask you something about AI per se, then about the relationships you, which you have mentioned, and then maybe a question with regards to sustainable development. The first question is, uh, we are in Europe and um, the European Union is quite famous um, for regulation of AI. The AI community is actually as far as to my knowledge, a bit upset at the speed of how um, AI is developed in the European Union. Um, there are examples from Asia where there is no um, control on inventions or on AI development. So um, from a scientific point of view, a scientist needs to work freely and um, without borders to, to invent. Um, so to come up with um, good technology. And on the other side, the EU, for example, says, well, there are some moral questions which needs to be asked, and therefore we need to limit or regulate AI. Uh, what would be your position? Do we need to regulate this more because of moral reasons? Or do we, do we need to let the scientists do their job and later figure out how to um, use the technology? Yeah, I think the pursuit of pure science is a dangerous one. I think we have seen that in certain um, scenarios where science has gone too far. And um, just recently, somebody has used CRISPR to genetically modify an embryo so that the child born is resistant to AIDS. I think you've heard about that story. And on moral reflection, that doctor had to apologize for what they did. And that's quite a, a minor experiment that scientists have done involving morally significant entities in the 50s, 60s, 70s, particularly in Russia, but I, I am not so naive to think that Europe was also not involved in experiments involving very morally dubious 
dubious things. For example, um, transplanting entire human heads or monkey heads onto human bodies. So I don't buy the argument that science should just have a free for all. I think we do need moral limitations. I think the problem with AI is you either have an all or nothing approach. Either AI is an advanced algorithm, by which case it is not artificial intelligence, it is simply machine learning or an advanced algorithm, or it is an actual intelligent being. It is actually intelligent, not artificial, but has a intelligence that is similar or at least indistinguishable from human intelligence, at which case you cannot control it. And so the first question is to ask the question, should we create a self-conscious non-human entity? And if your answer is yes, then you cannot go any further. You cannot say, okay, what type of entity? I think that's dangerous because we'd be saying in similar situations in the past, we should emancipate slaves, but we're not going to emancipate them further. I think you and I as persons as rational beings, we will, lead, we will go in a direction. And no amount of science and psychology and limitations will limit our creativity, our thinking, our free thoughts. We, we have tried to limit them for. So if the European Union's idea is to limit proper sentient artificial intelligence in some way, they can't do that. They can only stop it from taking place, but they can't limit how it will be developed or what directions it will take once it's developed. That's impossible. I think that's totally impossible. And I think also history would teach us that at some point we may need to apologize to the robots and the way we've treated them. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, then I would have a second question and that would relate to this um, relationships which you have mentioned. So, or maybe a step back, uh, what are persons? So you mentioned embryos, um, little um, infants that might not have all the characteristics of a person because they're not developed. And you ask whether or not they can be uh, or can refer to, to be human beings, which is a, a good question. And you mentioned other examples of how we need to ask questions about um, personhood. You mentioned slavery, you mentioned Holocaust, where persons were taken away from their right to be a person. So I, I, I think that makes sense. But if we are thinking of um, giving AI um, the right of a person, what benefits do you see in it? Not, not only a philosophical question whether or not um, they could have theoretically the right, as you were referring um, with infants and other um, strategies, but uh, is there a uh, benefit we can have to it. Um, and I phrase the question a bit differently. If we are having this aware discussion about personhood to AI, can the granting of giving AI the, the, the status of, um, of a person also prevent maybe a future systematic racism or other kind of systematic di discrimination? If we are aware of rights of persons, we see it more often that persons are stripped away from their rights. So is this discussion a merit to, to preventing maybe bad things in also our community? Because you, are, you were mentioning it, that adding them into the community would be a benefit. So um, can you elaborate on this? Yes, so firstly, um, we must remember Kant's argument about the very nature of persons, that persons should not be treated as a means to an end, but an end in themselves. In other words, we could not and should not ask, what is the benefit of granting them personal status? Because as persons, it doesn't matter what benefit there is. They have value simply as persons. It doesn't matter if they do or do not bring benefit to that category of beings. Persons do not earn their status. They are granted that status. The question draws back to your first question. Are we creating sentient AI or are we simply trying to develop better algorithms. If we're trying to develop better algorithms, then the benefit to the human race is huge. If we're creating sentient beings, then just like we have learned the lessons of how we have treated other people, we have to learn the lesson of how we will treat this sentient being. And I'm hoping it's not a case of it will contribute 
to limit or reduce racism so much as it will be a sign that we have already moved beyond racism. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. When we are then presented with a being that relates to us in personal ways, we acknowledge what is intrinsic in that being, it is valuable. And so in the same way as we should acknowledge beings that are not like us, other cultures, other genders, other ways of being, that we acknowledge them as persons. If we are successful in creating sentient AI, it is not a case of granting it person status. It is a case of recognizing its already existing personal status. So I'm hoping it's a sign that the human being has gone further and we're not still in our old ways of trying to enslave persons. Yeah, I, I would have a comment on that, just like to, to nurture the conversation a bit. Um, if you're saying we, we should not see it as a benefit because someone or AI would have the person personhood right, and the, the, this question is somehow to diminish, I, I, I see the point, but if we would imagine um, someone gets the status of personhood, naturally, as you say, and then it appears that that person becomes um, dangerous or bad for society. So obviously in the philosophical argumentation, I can follow it, that, that there is no question of giving benefit because it's a natural right. I, I, I see your point, but somehow still we define ourselves somehow as humans. So you try to make the, the difference between humans and personhood, which is also very logical. But if we would imagine we expanding our community, uh, humans are somehow always doing rules and how to join a club, for example, there are always some, some, some kind of conditions. Do we need conditions um, still so, somehow in your opinion, uh, if that person could become somehow dangerous to us? No, my simple answer would be no. No matter how dangerous that being is, it's not dependent, on, their status as person is not dependent on their behavior. So for example, Hitler, one of the most violent, dangerous beings ever to walk, is still considered a person. They are still included in the members or in the category of persons. So it doesn't matter how a person behaves, they remain a person. Now, that doesn't mean we wouldn't take action. Please don't misunderstand me. But nevertheless, Hitler retained a universal, unqualified dignity and a right to life. Of course, in some cases, we can overwrite that life, that right. But that doesn't mean the right doesn't exist. It simply means in this case, we are going to overwrite that for the benefit of the community. And that argument could be made. We could say, look, this AI has become um, self-conscious um, and it started to create a war against human beings and we now need to exterminate this AI. Nevertheless, the AI remains a person just like Hitler was a person. And it was right to fight against Hitler. And it was right ultimately to go to war and to stop Hitler from doing what he wanted to do. But it doesn't change the underlying ontological status of Hitler as a person having a right to life. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think that was a very um, interesting pass you have taken us today. Um, I would have would have not any further questions because we are also um, ending this session in two minutes. I would just again look into the audience if we have more questions. Um, I don't see any more questions. Maybe do you have any more comments which you would like to give or maybe a final thought before we would formally end the session. I think my final thought would be very much like a blog post I put on practical ethics at Oxford University just two weeks ago, that we need to be careful with how we speak about AI, treat AI, regulate AI, because it is possible in a few years time that we may begin the sentence, dear robots, we are sorry for what we have done. Thank you for having me today.
thank you for the final work and uh, we see each other in a month for the next HESA series sustainability session and thank you for your attendance. Bye. Bye.